Buenos dias. Good morning, mi gente. How are you? Welcome to the Making Latino Health Count Forum. My name is Mariana McDonald, and I'm here representing with my co-chair, Dr. Ken Dominguez. Wave your hand, please. Thank you. <laughs> the CDC ATSDR Latino Hispanic Health Work Group. We start today's work by sharing a little bit of our extraordinarily rich and diverse Latino culture. So why do we do this? Understanding cultural expressions of Latino traditions, values, and beliefs is an area of great importance for health professionals seeking to improve Latino Hispanic health. With the growth and diversification of US Latino populations, this has become an urgent task. Public health and medical professionals, in order to be culturally competent in interactions with Hispanic populations, need to understand and appreciate how Latino cultural expressions are not entertainment to be consumed, but instead represent core aspects of identity and behaviors. For these reasons, we open today's event with an expression of the vibrant and resilient cultures that are the voice of Latino Hispanic people's aspirations, hopes, and realities. You may not know that April is National Poetry Month. Happy National Poetry Month. <laughs> um, we had hoped to have the country's first Latino poet laureate Juan Felipe Herrera with us today, um, but his requirements um, being in that position during National Poetry Month made that not possible. So today I'm going to read to you from En Español Decimos Declamar, a poem by Cuban poet Nicolás Guillén, known as the National Poet of Cuba. Guillén was born July 10th, 1902, and died July 16th, 1989. He was a poet, journalist, political activist, and writer. An Afro-descendant, Guillén's work expresses a personal account of the cultures, the struggles, hopes, and cultural vitality of Afro-Cubans. His poem, Tango, which we'll hear from first in Spanish and then English, is the exuberant declaration of the many joys and accomplishments a humble person, a black man, encounters in his transformed homeland, his beloved Cuba. Tengo. Cuando me veo y toco, yo Juan sin nada, no más ayer. Y yo y Juan con todo, y yo con todo vuelvo. Los ojos miro, me veo y toco y me pregunto, ¿Cómo ha podido ser? Tengo, vamos a ver, tengo el gusto de andar por mi país, dueño de cuanto hay en él, mirando bien de cerca lo que antes no tuve ni podía tener. Zafra, puedo decir, monte, puedo decir, ciudad, puedo decir, ejército, decir, ya míos pa siempre, y tuyos, nuestros, y un ancho resplandor de rayo, estrella, flor. Tengo, vamos a ver, tengo el gusto de ir yo, campesino, obrero, gente simple. Tengo el gusto de ir, solo un ejemplo, a un banco y hablar con el administrador, no en inglés, no en señor, sino decirle compañero como se dice en español. Tengo, vamos a ver, que siendo un negro, nadie me puede detener a la puerta de un dancing o un bar, o bien en la carpeta de un hotel gritarme que no hay pieza, una mínima pieza y no hay una pieza colosal, una pequeña pieza donde yo pueda descansar. Tengo que, como tengo la tierra, tengo el mar, no country, no high life, no tennis, y no yacht. 
sino de playa en playa y ola en ola. Gigante, azul, abierto, democrático, en fin, el mar. Tengo, vamos a ver, que ya aprendí a leer, a contar. Tengo que ya aprendí a escribir y a pensar y a reír. Tengo que ya tengo donde trabajar y ganar lo que me tengo que comer. Tengo, vamos a ver, tengo lo que tenía que tener. I have. When I look at and touch myself, I, Juan, only yesterday with nothing, and Juan with everything today, I glance around. I look and see and touch myself and wonder how it could have happened. I have, let's see. I have the pleasure of walking my country, the owner of all there is in it, examining at very close range what I could not and did not have before. I can say sugarcane, I can say mountain, I can say army, army say, now mine forever and yours, ours, and the vast splendor of the sunbeam, the star, the flower. I have, let's see, I have the pleasure of going, me, a peasant, a worker, a simple man. I have the pleasure of going, just an example, to a bank and speaking to the manager, not in English, not in sir, but in compañero, as we say in Spanish. I have, let's see, that being black, I can be stopped by no one at the door of a dancing hall or bar, or even at the desk of a hotel, have someone yell at me, there are no rooms, a small room and not one that's immense, a tiny room where I might rest. I have that having the land, I have the sea, no country clubs, no high life, no tennis, and no yachts, but from beach to beach and wave on wave, gigantic, blue, open, democratic, in short, the sea. I have, let's see, that I have learned to read, to count. I have that I have learned to write and to think and to laugh I have that now I have a place to earn and work and earn what I have to eat. I have, let's see, I have what was coming to me. Thank you. While our speakers join us um, at the, on the dais, I just would like to say again, to echo Mariana's comment, welcome to our Public Health Ethics Symposium. This is the second one, and we are very excited to have this second annual symposium. My name is Joe Valentine, and I am the Associate Director for Health Equity in the Division of STD Prevention. And it is great, with great honor and privilege that I get to speak to you this morning and act as a moderator for a very distinguished panel, which I, I won't do too much about the moderating, so I'll try to remind them about time. That will be my main role. So in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is introduce everybody initially and then sort of disappear from the dais and leave it um, to our speakers to, to move through the program. I would first like to introduce um, Dr. Leandris LeBird. Um, I ask, you know, what would I say about each of them when I was introducing them? And I, I don't like really reading bios to people. You can read those for yourself, but at least I can say I have a very personal relationship with most of the folks here. And so I'm very excited to be able to say that working with Leandris has been an incredible and wonderful opportunity. I've known her for a long time, and I tell you, she's a true champion of health equity and the reduction of health disparities. So it is really an honor to introduce her. Dr. Reuben Warren, I knew his name long before I ever knew him, and now I'm really privileged and honored to be the project officer for his uh, project, 
looking uh, at the apology commemorative and ex expanding public health ethics at Tuskegee University. And I just think it's a wonderful opportunity, again, to work with him on this new effort of the public health ethics symposium that we have now been uh, planning for, like I said, the second year. So welcome, Dr. Reuben Warren, to the uh, CDC, or because he is returning. He's retired CDC, so welcoming him back to, doc uh, to CDC. And then Dr. Furman, whom I have not just met just this morning, so I don't get to have much to say here in terms of a long-term relationship, but I know that the work going forward at Tuskegee, we will have much more contact. And again, I want to welcome you to CDC, and he is a professor at Tuskegee University. And, and finally, but certainly not least, um, Ms. Carmen Villar, whom I first met when she was an intern at the Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention, and we found out we were social workers. So yes, CDC does hire social workers. We're sort of undercover, and uh, people don't really know that we're around, but look, look, at, look at where we are. I am a social worker, and Carmen is a social worker, and that, we bonded immediately that way. So it's really exciting to see her now. She's a chief of staff for our agency and for Dr. Frieden, and it is a great honor and privilege that you're with us today. So um, again, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. LeBird, and um, please speakers, if you'll just come to the podium according to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and good morning again. I'm so glad to see all of you here. And um, on behalf of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, we are very excited to welcome you to the second Public Health Ethics Forum that's co-sponsored by our office, by Tuskegee University, by Morehouse School of Medicine, um, the Division of Sexually Transmitted Diseases, and the National Center for HIV and AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. The CDC ATSDR Latino Hispanic Health Work Group and also our national partners um, that are the Hispanic Serving Health Profession Schools, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, and the National Hispanic Medical Association. The Hispanic Serving Health Profession Schools, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, and the National Hispanic Medical Association have long histories working with CDC and other federal agencies to advance Hispanic health. Uh, these national organizations have been at the forefront for decades in advocating for greater attention to many of the issues that will be addressed and raised today, as well as working to ensure that there is a diverse, culturally competent, and well-prepared public health and healthcare workforce. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Reuben Warren and the role that he and Tuskegee University play um, in, in leading uh, the work on behalf of racial and ethnic minority populations to achieve health equity, as well as ensuring that there is an ethical practice of public health. Um, many of you are on our campus for the first time, and we are honored by your participation in this historic forum. Uh, we want to especially acknowledge and greet the Minister of International Relations for the Dominican Republic, Dr. Sanchez Cardenas, and Dr. Furman, who is the provost at Tuskegee University, and you will hear from both of them today. Today's forum is also part of our National uh, Minority Health Month celebration. Um, this year's theme for National Minority Health Month is accelerating health equity for the nation. Um, health equity is defined by the Department of Health and Human Services as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. But there's a subtext to that, which I think is particularly important to highlight. And that is that achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, 
and the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. The contribution of public health in attaining the highest level of health for all people is grounded in our ability to collect, analyze, interpret, and report accurate and useful data, which is then used to inform decisions about how to protect and promote the population's health. And so as our nation is becoming increasingly more diverse, the data we collect must keep pace with not only changing demographics, but also be sensitive to the historical and contemporary experiences of communities that help shape opportunities for the best health possible. So why are we here? Well, last year, CDC released its first Hispanic Health Vital Signs Report. And you will hear more about this report during one of the panel discussions. Um, we were able to document differences in health profiles between Hispanic and Latino populations in the US. Today, we hope to build upon this experience by exploring data and its implications for the promotion and protection of Hispanic health through the lens of public health ethics. At the end of the day, we hope the information exchanged will broaden opportunities to reduce health disparities among Latinos and Hispanics, and that each of you will take away ideas for specific contributions your respective organizations can make to advance and accelerate the achievement of health equity in the US. Seated among you today are representatives from federal health agencies, academic institutions, community-based organizations, foundations, and CDC programs. Please don't leave today without meeting at least 10 people that you didn't know before you came. They might just be the partner you've been looking for to take your work to improve Hispanic health to the next level. While our focus today is on Hispanic health, I believe that working together in this way across racial and ethnic groups, we all can attain the highest level of health for all people. So thanks for being here and I look forward to meeting you. Good morning again. I put my folder down on this high tech technology and the slides start flowing. So uh, forgive me, you can take them back. Thank you so much for being here and I want to, in the interest of time, just take a few minutes, maybe seconds to tell you why we're here, why I'm here. 101 years ago, a man called Booker T. Washington looked at the health of black Americans throughout the country and said to himself and to others, we need to focus on the health of those in greatest need. And at this point in time, 1915, that happened to be African Americans. 100 years later, as we sat and talked about this wonderful month called Minority Health Month, this wonderful month called National Public Health Month, we looked and said, what populations are disproportionately suffering the burden of preventable diseases, conditions? And guess what? the African-American population still disproportionately suffered. Not only did that population suffer, but other populations of color suffered from needless preventable diseases and conditions. So I, I, um, we decided to celebrate 100 years of Booker T. Washington's life and legacy. And 
at Tuskegee. We said, we'll do that by retracing what Booker T. Washington did over his lifetime, not honoring his death, but honoring his life. And we picked a different venue, a different activity where he made his contributions. And lo and behold, health was one of them. So we reached out to CDC, because that really is the agency that promotes health promotion, disease prevention, in my view, more than any other. And we talked with a colleague, Dr. Excuse me, Ms. Jo Valentine. And we decided, I decided to work with her to celebrate that, that, that month. She said, that's not big enough. So we contacted Dr. LeBerg. And now we've got a forum that, that really celebrates Minority Health Month, every population that fits within that rubric. And what we're here to, to, to do today, as we did last year, was to give you a different lens to look through. We've looked through the lens of epidemiology, uh, biostatistics, health service administration, all those disciplines in public health, trying to eliminate health disparities so that we can then fully celebrate health equity. And it hadn't worked. Regardless of what you say, the data tell us it has not worked. So we're here to look through those same issues through a different lens, a lens called public health ethics. Not bioethics, which is an important part of this conversation, but public health ethics. How do we look at populations issues? How do we look at issues of not just justice, but social justice? How do we look at issues of not benevolence, but beneficence. How do we do that? This conversation is to further that exploration. Last year we had a wonderful time. We had a wonderful conversation. And some of the artists said, well, what about other people of color? I said, you're right. We had planned it, but quite frankly, the message came from the community, where it should always come from. And so this year we've decided to work every week to make this forum possible. So you're gonna hear some things that you haven't heard before, or some things that you heard before and maybe didn't believe, or some things you heard before, believed, and wanted to hear again. You'll hear all those things today, plus even, even more. Uh, look around, find somebody new, or somebody you didn't know. Find somebody you already knew and have that conversation. We're gonna have a good time. This is a time to learn and do and have a good time. I'm excited and I look forward to talking with you throughout the day. Welcome and thank you for being here. I step away and step back. That, that's how spirit works. When I, when, we, when I talk to my friend and colleague, Dr. Furman about this year's effort in Latino and Hispanic health. He went on to tell me about the many, many things that he's doing, he's been doing, and wanted to do. And I said, just don't tell me, Dr. Furman, let's tell the world. And the best place to talk about health promotion, disease prevention, and interaction is at CDC. And that's just my bias. So I said, why don't we come and have you come and share some of the exciting things that you're doing uh, because this is an opportunity to not only talk about what's going on in this country, but what's going on globally. An opportunity to talk about health promotion, disease prevention globally, in opposed to talking about disease, which is a global phenomenon. So Dr. Furman said, I'd be excited about doing this. As a matter of fact, I have a colleague who may also be interested in coming. Now let me put the hat on that he wears, or the hats on that he wears. Professor of Biology, well-accomplished biomedical scientist, provost, vice president, and most importantly, Caesar Furman is a friend. Dr. Furman, please join us. Good morning. Time to wake up. As Dr. Warren just said, my name is Caesar Furman. 
And it gives me great pressure to be here, first of all, to thank CDC for hosting this. I know that the bioethic has a lot to do with it, but you made it possible for this, and I appreciate that. And I bring you greetings on behalf of our seventh president, Brian Johnson from Tuskegee University, which after eight and a half years there, I come to learn that it is a shrine, not a university. It's a shrine of knowledge and a beacon of hope for the world. And those of us who are inside understand this better, no offense to those who are outside. So I've been in the United States, I'm from the Dominican Republic, and so is Vice Minister Sanchez. I've been here over 40 years, uh, hacking the system, working like crazy to get tenure and so on. But this is probably the most exciting day of my life. Even though, as you know, I was just commencement speaker of a very large university. But this is really the consummation of my sacrifice to be at a place where our people, Hispanics, are seen as not as a victim, but as a population that is being overlooked. Now, Dr. Warren and I have often heated discussions and arguments, and many people think I'm tough because I am tough. I don't take uh, excuses. But we agree on one thing, and that is we like things that will help our brothers and sisters. He challenged me, as he said a few minutes ago, a little bit more than he say, to start the conversation this morning. So I am not going to be telling you that I'm a philosopher, because I'm not, as he says, a biologist. I don't mean to be a preacher, because I've never been one. But I want to show you a few things that I think are going to start the conversation. And the first thing that I'm going to show you is that um, I assume this is, oh, it's processed right here. I assume that the challenge is going to be to convince those of you who are not challenged yet to understand that what Dr. Warren just said is real, is, is with us. It's not just a utopia. Now, someone he knows very well, her name is Dr. Dolores Alexander, the director of our uh, very successful integrated bioscience PhD program, sent this to me, and I love it, because it just shows the problem. We know clearly, and those of you who remember separate but equal can quickly see the problem right here, all right? And God knows that we're equal. As you know, only 1% of the genome determines whether we are white, black, yellow, blue, have kinky hair, straight hair, blue eye, brown eye, 1%. The rest, 99%, join us as brothers and sisters. But we always ignore the 99%. So I start my conversation with this, and what you can read, which I'm not going to read to you. It's OK to understand the problems. And if you can afford it, you can have a choice. But the problem is when you don't have a choice, and you can afford it. Now, what qualifies me to be talking to you and challenging you this morning? Well, this little house that you see here at the end, uh, this works? No, it's not pointing. Anyway, it says here, aquí vivió César. It says Caesar lived here. We were eight children, two parents, and the house is less than 200 square feet of space. No running water, no lights, and that fellow on the right-hand side is sitting next to the only latrine that we had. That's what I went to uh, junior high school. So that is my qualification. It's now my five patents, my three diplomas, and all the other garbage that I've done. But the fact that I know what I'm telling you, because I lived it. And as you will hear from my colleague and friend, which is my lost and found brother, I just met him less than a year ago. He is going to show you statistics, how the government is finally, and I feel so accelerated, is addressing these issues. So I'm not showing you this to, so you can feel bad about me, because you see what I've done. I'm provost of one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And I didn't buy that, by the way. 
but to show you that I'm qualified to talk to you about the problems that we are addressing today in this conference. Now, you might say, but well, we are educate and we know what the problems are. Of course we are. Any one of you remember this? How many years it took for us to accept the fact that cigarettes cause cancer? So that doesn't have to be repeated anymore, right? Yet, this is the uh, advertisement on some of the most prominent magazines of the time. And I didn't show you everything, but there are many from famous people such as uh, President Reagan smoking and saying, if you don't smoke, you're not important. So the point is that knowing the issues, which we do, and I thank the CDC for putting out all the stuff that's putting out, is not yet addressing the matter at the heart of it. And the reason is because by the time that the people who are affected learn what the problem is, it passed and it's already the damage is done. I don't know how many of you agree with that, right? So what has happened to us? And again, I'm not a philosopher, but I want, my hobby is following this topic for many years, and my source is consumer reports, because for 35 years that I bought it, I have never seen them pr providing any biased reports. Now, this is from a book that I read when I was 14 years old that I found in the trash in Spanish that is called Salud y Vigor por la Alimentación, which is health and strength and vigor for, by nutrition. This is 1956. And the book is about 500 pages long, and it tells you everything you need to do to stay healthy. And the bottom line is, eat well, drink a lot of water, and stay away from trouble. So the, on the right, what do we have? Is it last week, Sunday's newspaper. All right, and please understand that we know that there are people who cannot control weight for hormonal issues, hereditary matters, that's not the issue. But what has happened between 1956 and 2006? You see these recruits being in the army being screened, and you have a brother on the, probably the only brother up there, and he doesn't look overweight, and none of the other fellows looks overweight. Now look on the right. So what happened to us? the issue that we're addressing today here. We are not reaching the people who are suffering, even though, thanks to God, we also have our director of Health Spirity Institute starting a whole new wave of attacking the problems. But we are not reaching the masses. And why? Well, because the message is hidden, convoluted, and sometimes not, it's unintentional, but it is targeted. And I'm going to use two examples to demonstrate to you my theory, which maybe is crazy, and you're going to say, that guy shouldn't be pros because he doesn't know what he's talking about. The first one is how an international decision can lead to such a mess. When I came here in 1974, our peso was almost equal to $1. And that was based exclusively on sugarcane production. Then enter corn syrup and corn subsidies. Now, what do you have? We have now the development of the fastest and the most dangerous diabetes-causing agent in this country, corn syrup. Why? Because it is a straight substance that can be absorbed through the mucous membrane of the GI from the time you put it in your mouth to the time that goes out. The mucus can absorb it. And in doing so, doesn't use any energy. We're not gonna go through a biochemistry class here but you know that there is something called energy, ATP, and to break things up, you need to use ATP. So you can look it up. Walk to Wikipedia. So now our peso is devaluated to the point that it took the government, thanks God to the new government, a huge measures and policy, public policy, social justice changes, Dr. Root, Warren, to bring this about. Meanwhile, the damage is done, which is what I say. So now, our peso is devaluated. All the Dominicans that could have stayed there and worked and get a family and get an education has to go to New York and Miami to clean toilets. And Dr. Sanchez is gonna talk about that this afternoon, so don't miss it. And again, now you go to the Dominican Republic, and what do you find? Take a guess in the streets, Burger King, McDonald's, Jack in the Box, and 
what is demonstrated right here. You can buy this, you can get this at the CDC and then NIH. It's up to 10, but you can see what happened, what I just say. So refined sugar, which come from sugar cane, was slowly coming down and syrup goes up. And with it goes diabetes, obesity, and all the issues that we see now with children less than 10 years old already with type 2 diabetes. So are we reaching the target population? No. And here it is the same issue. Obesity percentage in direct proportion to the production of high corn syrup. That's not the only reason, but it's certainly one of the main ones. So why is this happening? Because it is a, driven by profits, not driven by public policy and social justice. That's why it's happening. And I'm not saying that we're going to forget money because we can't do anything with money. I just drove here from Tuskegee and I had to put gas in the car. And so, how many of you remember until Michelle Obama got in the case and got the ads of out of the te television, just about a year ago, there was a bunch of ads. Sugars are sugars, doesn't matter what they are. You remember that? It was all over the, ne the newspapers, all over the news. But it is not. Look at the sweetening level of each one of these sweeteners. It's not the same. And again, it says there that sucrose, which is sugar cane, and high corn fruct fructose are the same, but I just told you that it takes two ATP molecules to break sucrose into fructose and pentose, okay? And you can look it up on Wikipedia. Now, you don't believe me? This is stored in, in Tuskegee, on Main Street of Tuskegee. is a discount store. There are two, two grocery store, and Dr. Herrera can attest to this, that sells green stuff that grows on the ground. The rest is this, which is the color sugar water that gives you a high of about 10 minutes, and then you have to go and get some more because there is no more energy to go. So that is my conclusion from my first point on how we have profit, drive the message that doesn't reach the target population, and we do reach them when it's already too late. My second point is, you already saw this, is I'm going to talk about my own issue. I was diagnosed two years ago with a prostate cancer, which happened to every old man. Uh, you get something called uh, hyperplasia, dysplasia, and so on, and then the urologist want to rip you apart because it will make you feel better. Well, this on the left is the number of documents, you can see how thick it is, look at the scissors, from top to bottom that I, as a scientist, read from the NIH, Wikipedia, anywhere, CDC. And after reading more than 10,000 pages, the conclusion was that no, I don't have a solution to make on this case because none of these interventions offer any hope. So why was so hard for me to read all that stuff? Because the way in which we try to teach the population is convoluted. Look at this. Advil, two pills, the same pill, the same content, two different colors, and they have different prices. So what is the target? Is the pain of the patient or is the profit of the company? Here it is, another example. So you finish this work in 12 hours digging holes in the, in the, in the yard for a rich person, go get on the trend, go to McDonald's and see these choices and you only have five bucks to spend, what are you gonna do? And Dr. Sanchez Cardenas is gonna talk to you a little bit about that, what the government is doing down there to make sure that this doesn't happen down there, even though we cannot stop McDonald's from coming in there. And then I invite each one of you to read this most incredibly uh, uh, work because it's very, very challenging and you might think the guy's crazy, but it has a very good point and that is that we are sanitizing the message that should go out straight and sanitized. Good example from Consumer Report, Viagra. 
What does Viagra do? It stimulates something called nitrox oxide that expands the blood vessel in organs like the penis that makes it large when you have circulation. And you know what does the same thing? A very high diet of arginine amino acid. One can be patent, the other one cannot be patent. And then the last problem, and I almost finished, don't worry, is what we tell people and what the health system think. I'm working 30, 35 years in hospital. I'm an MD, but I'm in hospital 35 years. You see here what the doctor think and what the patient think. When consumer report asks the patients the same question and asks the doctor, you can see how dispar the disparity is at that level. What they think they're accomplishing is not what they're accomplishing. And then, of course, this is my last slide. You can see I am 65, so I'm now getting ready to Medicare and stuff. Listen, it was easy for me to get a PhD to understand all this stuff. So how can my mom or my brother, who doesn't even understand what HHMO is, make its informed decision? And there, I feel sorry for our director of health disparity, because how can he possibly reverse this in a short time? It's going to take some time. So what have we, uh, the current state is basically that our education is convoluted. The messages are very sanitized and it's, it's wrong. What we learn is that it would be critical for us to begin reaching the K-12 pipeline. It has to start that early. We cannot wait until the guy is 15 to tell him that having sex is gonna make a person pregnant and also infected. It has to start when they are six or seven years old. Well, what is missing? Well, we're gonna have to adopt and adopt some practices that we might not want to do. And with that, I conclude my challenge to the audience to begin this conference, and I hope that I didn't bore you to death. And do we have time for questions? We don't have time to question, but we can. Si, no entendiste. Okay, you want me to summarize the talk? Okay, quiere que sumarese? Quiere que no? I didn't know that I was going to say. I didn't know that I was supposed to give my talk in Spanish, but I could. If you want me to do it again, I can do it in Spanish. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fermin, for that um, great presentation. I, I want to say, again, I'm Carmen Villar, um, and I'm the chief of staff here at CDC. I uh, grew up in Los Angeles and uh, will say that I have never seen a waffle taco before in my life, nor eaten one, so that was really enlightening for me. Uh, anyway, thank you. I have uh, two jobs today. One is to welcome you to CDC, and the second is intro to introduce our um, honorable speaker today. So let me welcome you formally to CDC. Thank you for coming uh, on a Friday to visit us here in Atlanta, if you're not from here. Um, we, I am so excited about today's um, event. I have to say that the partners have been thanked. I want to thank them all again, especially Tuskegee, uh, for helping us bring the whole group together. We have the National Hispanic Medical Association. We have Hispanic Serving Health uh, Professional Service Schools and the National um, Alliance for Hispanic Health and Tus Tuskegee University in Morehouse. I, I really do want to say that this, for me personally and for the agency, is really um, an exciting day. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, I also want to bring greetings from Dr. Frieden, who I know if, if he was here would be jumping up in his seat and asking a lot of questions, um, not only about um, diabetes and obesity and things that were just touched upon, but also I know what we're going to hear from, from our uh, guest speaker in a second. Um, so I bring greetings from him. Um, I also uh, just want to say to Dr. LeBird in her office that I've worked at CDC now for a long time. I'm not going to say, as you heard from Joe, and uh, and the things and the efforts that she is 
uh, pulling together in her office are historical in nature for this agency. And I really just want to say thank you to her and her leadership and to all of you who are not, some of you I know are part of her office, but part of CDC for supporting her in that endeavor and really giving us the space, I think, for all of our scientists and folks who are invested in these issues to really come forward and allow some of this good work um, to happen. We still have a long way to go. We know that, and that's one of the main reasons why we're here today. I have to say, when I came to CDC, OMB was um, in the process of, of trying to figure out how to change their data collection categories uh, for race and ethnicity. Um, and, and coming from the West Coast, I have to say that I really grew up and I didn't really know what a, his, what a Hispanic was. I had never really heard that word. Um, and when I came out here, I had to look it up because I was a Mexicana or a Chicana or Latina. I had all of those labels, but I had never heard this word. So, um, <clears throat> Great, it makes it a lot easier in some regards to group us all together. But I think um, as we saw and as Dr. LeBird mentioned in our Vital Signs on Hispanic Health, which really you're gonna hear from some of the authors and coordinators of that piece and I really do need to give a shout out to them. Not only did they do a great time on a first ever publication on Hispanic health, but they also um, just a few weeks ago won a CDC honor award for their efforts. So I think we should. Um, anyway, but what we did see from that report are there are differences in our health comes, obviously, because we're all a little bit different from different places. Uh, we may have grown up in not only different countries, but different parts of the United States with different values. In my case, I also have a Japanese mother, so I identify as Hispanic, but I also identify as Asian. And uh, what does that make me when we think about data collection? I will tell you, my race officially could be white or could be Asian. And when I fill out those forms, I'm not ever sure what to do. And I'm sure I mess up the statistics because I check multiple boxes. And uh, I'm sure people are very, very confused. But this is why we're here. And this is why these issues are so important. We, I have um, the honor and the pleasure of being at many uh, important meetings in my job. I get to meet really cool people uh, and really highly educated and uh, high achievers all the time. Um, and it's a privilege and an honor. And I have to say, I, I see Dr. Richardson here. She's on our advisory committee to the director. Um, and we were just in an all day meeting yesterday with some of the best leaders in public health that I've ever met and the most inspiring people that, um, that are out there doing public health work. But Today, for me personally, and I think for this agency, and when we think about health uh, for Hispanics, but for um, everyone, especially uh, as it relates to social justice and social welfare, we, th today is more exciting than yesterday was for me personally, because these are hard issues that we don't always take time to address. And it's really easy when we're publishing a paper or we're collecting data or we're trying to make a statement to look at Hispanics. It makes it easier that way. But we're not all the same. The health outcomes we know now are not all the same. And this is our challenge. How do we do this in a way that makes sense, that delineates and identifies the problem so that folks at universities or other places in the community can target their research or their interventions appropriately? How do we do this in a way that is fair and ethical? And I really want to thank all of you for being here today to address these critical issues in public health and health uh, more broadly. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to greet you. And my second job, as I said when I started, is to uh, introduce our guest speaker. 
Um, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Perez Estable, but I do want to say congratulations on his position um, and that he is our director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH. Probably more so than CDC, NIH collects a lot of data. <laughs> and these issues are critical to how that data gets not only looked at and analyzed, but presented to the public. Um, his institute is, has a budget of $281 million, and uh, they conduct research and, and support and training and enhance research capacity and infrastructure um, for public health and public health education. The most intriguing part about um, Dr. Perez Estable to me is that he um, comes from San Francisco prior to this position um, where I also spent a good chunk of my life. Um, and he was the professor of medicine in chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at UCSF. So I know we are running behind. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Perez Estable to the stage. And thank you. Good morning, <clears throat> um, and thank you for uh, the invitation. It's a real honor to, uh, to be at CDC this morning and, and to talk about a topic that uh, is very uh, much um, close to my heart and my, um, and my brain. Um, I, I realize the title of the conference is on ethics, and I will try to make references to that because I don't think I really uh, have a lot of emphasis on that. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start by explaining a little bit about where NIMHD is at. Um, uh, our institute is only six years old. It was uh, initially an office and then became a center uh, in 2000. Um, and in 2010, as part of the ACA, it became a, an institute. All that time was led by Dr. John Ruffin, who was, um, uh, I think, a, a constant uh, leader in that, in that aspect at NIH. Um, in 2014, he retired, and after an, uh, Dr. Maddox was acting for uh, a year and a half, I, I started September 1. So this is my eighth month on the job. Um, our mission is to <clears throat> focus on research. As you know, um, NIH is about uh, science, and our mandate is to look at minority health as defined by racial ethnic groups in the U.S. The census. Uh, and uh, understand causes and reduce health disparities um, in specific populations, and I'll expand on this. We're also interested in training a diverse workforce, an issue that has become much more urgent um, in 2016, although we, do, we ourselves do not have a lot of training uh, programs. Uh, but I am working closely with Hannah Valentine and, and the diversity, the chief diversity officer at NIH to look at, uh, at this, these issues, both uh, in, inside the NIH as well as uh, nationally. So minority health, from <clears throat> our perspective, uh, we're defining as the characteristics attributed to the minority groups uh, in the U.S. Um, as defined by OMB, uh, we're not reinventing the wheel there. Um, and we are interested in issues that are relevant to each of those groups uh, within the group in comparison to whites across the, and, or in comparison to each other. Whether the outcome or the um, uh, results are uh, better or worse. So in this regards, it, it emphasizes the study of the minority groups. There is a general theme of social disadvantage <clears throat> amongst uh, all minorities, uh, frequently based in uh, being subject to discrimination. Uh, it varies. Uh, the historical legacy of uh, slavery in the United States and the African American community is unprecedented. Uh, but each of the minority groups have experienced, um, uh, in some aspect, uh, this adversity. And in, in addition to that, Minorities in the U.S. are historically underrepresented in all biomedical research. That has not been resolved, um, and almost always in the scientific workforce. So this, these are issues that unify us more than uh, separate us. Health disparities, on the other hand, really implies to me uh, an outcome that's uh, a, a disadvantage, an adverse uh, outcome by comparison to a reference group in a population that has been historically um, disadvantaged. Uh, generally speaking, <clears throat> when we refer to disparity populations at NIH, NIMHD, we're referring to race ethnic minority groups and 
uh, or uh, persons of low socioeconomic status or less privileged socioeconomic status. We're also legislated to include rural residents. Um, these are almost uniformly related to being um, uh, poor uh, or people of color. But um, there is an underserved component to being in a, a remote rural geographic location that I think needs to be considered. But we believe that is this uh, other subject to being discriminated against as a central theme of what leads to a disparity population. And there are other proposals uh, for including uh, disparity populations that uh, have not been uh, to this day yet endorsed by the Secretary um, of Health and Human Services. Um, and uh, the, the main one is the sexual gender minority group uh, that has been for discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. So a health disparity is defined as health difference that adversely affects a typically disadvantaged population based on one or more health outcome. And I'll try to, um, to create the, the categories of outcomes that we're interested in. Then our science uh, at NIMHD is devoted to advancing knowledge about what influences the different factors, health determinants, that and define mechanisms uh, that lead to these um, health outcome differences. Um, develop and test interventions uh, to reduce and uh, ultimately, uh, hopefully, eliminate uh, these health disparities when we can. Um, I emphasize this in part because at NIH, uh, NIMHD has not been uh, looked at necessarily as a scientific uh, institute. Um, and, uh, or it, uh, the perception has been that uh, NIMHD is about social determinants only. Um, and I believe that over the course of these um, 20 years, uh, 25 years, that uh, uh, this went from an office to a center to an institute, um, a robust community of scientists uh, outside of NIH has developed, uh, of which I was part of, uh, in multiple disciplines, in clinical medicine, in public health, uh, in behavioral health, um, and uh, in um, some uh, branches of basic science. And I think this is our time to capture this and channel this and create uh, the discipline uh, that would be, uh, that would create um, credibility uh, at NIH. Um, may have gone backwards there, yeah, thanks. Um, these are the health disparity outcomes that we are interested in looking at. Um, it starts with higher incidence or prevalence, that's a given, also premature or excessive mortality in areas where populations would differ. I like using a, a global burden of disease measure, that disability adjusted life years is one uh, that has been used extensively in global health and it allows us to compare the burden of illness of something like back pain that doesn't necessarily kill anybody, um, as well as depression, uh, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And, and the fourth category is that anything related to how people feel, um, whether it be health-related quality of life, daily functioning, such as activities of daily living, um, or other measures, uh, as long as they're standardized and valid. And I emphasize the latter point. Um, we're also very <clears throat> um, uh, thought, have thought and considered, well, what are the uh, mechanisms that lead to these disparities? And we've framed this in this working uh, uh, document on health disparity risk outcomes. Um, the first category is a well-being related to behavior, stress, um, environmental conditions, racism, um, and social factors including things like uh, limited English proficiency and violence, uh, exposure to violence, not being a victim only. Um, in the last 15 years, there's been an explosion of biological information uh, and science, um, perhaps started by the uh, Human Genome Project, but really has continued to increase at a, at a very um, sharp, uh, high slope. Uh, and I think understanding where the biology fits in into the social factors and lead to differences uh, is very important area. So earlier age of onset, whether it be gene variants that get discovered, metabolic differences, we heard about the sugar issue, does that affect different uh, race ethnic groups differently because of metabolism differences? Um, susceptibility to one or another toxin, uh, faster progression, greater severity of the illness, uh, it's often driven by some interaction between biology, uh, environment, and social factors. 
Um, in uh, NIH, the clinical world is not a front and center, and having uh, been a primary care general internist for um, uh, over 35 years, uh, I'm very close to feeling that disparities do happen in the healthcare setting, so I want to focus on clinical events and utilization of healthcare. So things that impact uh, health in the clinical setting include differential treatments, uh, patient-doctor communication, um, differences in adverse events to medications um, to, uh, that are prescribed, and also uh, events that don't quite have a diagnosis like a fall. And similarly, health services research, looking at access and abuse of services uh, and access hospitalizations uh, are all important areas that NIMHD would like to focus more on. I like to use this simple <clears throat> diagram to emphasize uh, minority health, health disparities, um, overlap but are not, are not completely overlapping. There are minority groups, of which Latinos are one, uh, where the leading causes of death and disability are actually lower uh, uh, than, um, than expected, uh, lower than the reference group, the whites. Uh, and what is that about? So because there are no health disparities in those leading causes of death and disability, do we say they're not disadvantaged? Well, that's not the case. But understanding why that may be, uh, I think, is an important scientific question uh, that we need to address at the same time that we're looking at issues related to disadvantage for the conditions that are disadvantaged. Uh, and this is how the two relate. Our program scientists uh, <clears throat> developed this framework um, it's uh, still, I would say, a work in progress, although um, to try to capture <clears throat> all of these different elements in a visual way, not to be comprehensive, but to emphasize the importance of the biology, the behavior, the physical and social cultural environment, uh, and as these interact uh, with the healthcare system to lead to differential health outcomes. Um, and then at the levels of influence, uh, the individual, the social network or interpersonal activities that occur, um, the community and the societal uh, factors. Um, and, uh, and you can see in our perspective, the fundamental factors being race, ethnicity, low socioeconomic status, and uh, the rural populations, which are mostly of the other two. Uh, let me finish this segment <clears throat> of the talk to clarify an important confusing point, at least at NIH, um, whereas minority health has often been labeled a study that includes minorities uh, in a significant way. So investigators uh, who submit grants uh, are asked to set how many people you're going to recruit in human studies, and they would say, well, we have 25% um, African Americans, 10% Latinos, and the rest white. And so that was over 25% minorities, so somebody decided that some years ago that that would be minority health because there were minorities in the study. Um, we need to correct that flawed mechanism, that flawed method, I should say. Um, it, to me, it's a different, it's a different uh, topic. It's inclusion. It's an important topic that we need to promote and, and, and emphasize, but is not to be confused with minority health. A good example is a diabetes prevention trial. Fantastic clinical trial has changed clinical practice in many ways. 40% of the participants were minorities. Um, that is not minority health. It is a, is a, a trial about intervention to prevent diabetes. Uh, that is very important to minorities as well as to uh, all the population. So uh, where this comes in at NIH is that <clears throat> we are tasked with an annual uh, evaluation of uh, looking at the NIH portfolio on minority health and health disparities, um, and not only to look at the content and topics by institute, um, but also a dollar amount. Uh, that gets reported to Congress. And the, the number that has been used, I think, is uh, not based on a valid method. Uh, most of us think it's overestimate, but we'll see when we do it right what happens. Um, we know that <clears throat> proportion of the U.S. population as minority is almost 40%, so inclusion is really an issue of social justice and common sense. Uh, these are the people who we're taking care of. On the other hand, a fourth area is work, biomedical workforce diversity, which uh, is almost in a, it is in a crisis mode. Um, the profession, uh, and I'm referring to me as a clinician as well as a scientist, uh, cannot look so different from the population. 
Um, and uh, in clinician clinical medicine, about 10, 12% of physicians are Latino or African American. American Indians barely register. Pacific Islanders are not that many either. And in the, in the um, biomedical workforce of scientists, we're looking at predominantly at PhDs, we're looking at about 5%, 6%. Um, Currently, in 2015, uh, a little over 2% of principal investigators at NIH are African American, uh, the funded ones, and about uh, not quite 4% are Latino. So we have a long ways to go. Um, and this is a, another area that I'm involved with as director of NIMHD, although we don't particularly focus on this in our, but working with Hannah Valentine and the leadership. So let me. Um, switch to more topics on Latino health. We, we're all familiar with this question. This is the question that uh, is used in the 2010 census. It was also used in 2000. Um, I think it was based on data collected in part by the CDC, but the OMB decided that at one point to ask ethnicity first in order to get a more accurate count of Latino Hispanic population in the US. We fill, I fill this out and then you put your country. Uh, I think it achieved a more accurate count, but I think it also led to confusion because there was option, there was uh, question number two, respond to this race. And these are the categories that you're all familiar with. I emphasize <clears throat> a couple of minor points here. Um, we should not be using the term Caucasian in any scientific uh, publication. It's an antiquated term of physical anthropology from the 19th century, and the anthropologists gave up on it over 100 years ago. Uh, you know the Caucasus are an area of Western, um, I guess Western Asia or Eastern Europe in, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, so it really doesn't reflect much of any uh, thing related to white individuals in, in, in the US. Um, the um, Asian population is extremely heterogeneous. Asian advocates are pushing hard for more disaggregation. And I'll refer to this with Latinos as well. Um, there's clearly heterogeneity in regards to diversity issues as well because Filipinos and Vietnamese and Southeast Asians in general are underrepresented and often underprivileged, so uh, as opposed to uh, Asian Indians or people from Northeast Asia. Pacific Islanders are a different race, and time and time again I see data from NIH that lumps Asian and Pacific Islanders together, and this is again the Pacific Islanders are a very small number. They're like American Indians in that regards, except, of course, uh, in the state of Hawaii and some areas of uh, California. And then we have the famous mixed or more than one race. This audience is familiar with this question. And in the year 2000, what was the proportion of people who checked that box? Somebody here must know the answer to that, right? It was 3%. 3.2%, I believe. We know that's not correct. Now, the Bay Area, of course, you know, is a very multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, 6% in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, clearly, people are still identifying predominantly, as we heard earlier, uh, with one group, although they could check different boxes. 2010, actually, the number of multiracial uh, people who check multiracial went down to 2.3%. So we're still not in a society that that has been embraced, although that's an ideal that people are aiming for at some point. The question doesn't work for these reasons. David Hayes Bautista made, um, showed me these data uh, a few years ago. So in the 2010 census, when Latinos answered the question about race, um, a little over half checked white. You can see that black is 2.5%, American Indian 1.4%. Uh, the column on the right is the national uh, data. Asian is a small number, Pacific Islander. But almost 40% either said uh, other, some other race or actually left it blank. And the response was, well, I already said my race. It's Latino. So why should I, I, should I give you another race? They didn't understand the question. It didn't get it, so part one was right. We got the a good count because you asked it first. So you always get the good count when you ask it first. Part two um, didn't work. And uh, when and the census decided to do this, I go, oh, that's interesting. That In California, we never did that because we would just ask the question as a single question and gave the options. And nobody ever had any trouble 
uh, self-identifying. The, the main group that had issues with the, the question of race, race or ethnicity uh, were often uh, foreign-born whites, uh, Europeans, who would say, well, I, I'm German or I'm, I'm this. Uh, and so getting country of origin gets at the granularity. I hear that the census is very much considering, OMB is very much considering going back to a single question for 2020 uh, and possibly adding um, a new ethnic group, Middle, uh, Middle Eastern, North African. Uh, I suspect some of these changes will need congressional approval, so I don't know what will happen with that uh, for 2020, but we'll see. Um, <clears throat> Latin America is a unique geographic population in the world. Um, to some extent, India is, uh, is like that, although we know less of that history, and it's much older. Um, and Hawaii is a more recent example of this admixture. Um, there were 500 years of history in Latin America, and populated by the native people, the indigenous people that uh, came from Asia, although the uh, genetic link is quite uh, remote at this point. Uh, the Europeans we know came uh, in 1492. And uh, six million Africans were uh, forcibly brought uh, to the Americas um, over the course of about um, 300 years. Um, four million went to South America or the Caribbean, uh, mostly Brazil and the islands. Um, but uh, two million came to the United States. So we have this shared heritage amongst the African Americans and the Latinos uh, in that history. Um, but this admixture these 20 generations of admixture um, have led to a, a unique population structure. And I think this is one of the things that makes Latinos so fascinating uh, from uh, a variety of perspectives, both uh, uh, advancing knowledge and science, uh, as well as uh, you could say social and, and for other reasons. Um, the mixtures are variable, um, as, you, as you well know, and are expressed phenotypically as well as, uh, as uh, reflected uh, genotypically. So I often, <clears throat> um, I don't hesitate to say that, you know, Cubans and Dominicans are different. Uh, I'm from Cuba, Puerto Ricans, you know, we're all part of the Caribbean, Argentina, uh, Colombia. Uh, so we can emphasize differences, but my position is that in the United States, uh, Latinos have more similarities and differences, despite these national origin differences. Um, we have a mix of culture and themes that unify us. There is a central role of the Spanish language, not to, um, uh, one also that has to acknowledge more recent immigrants from, particularly from Central America and Southern Mexico who, uh, who do not speak Spanish or speak Spanish very, uh, very poorly. Um, this racial mixture, these 500 years have led to this unique mix, and I think there is uh, interesting, uh, not just social, cultural, and political history there, but potentially uh, biological uh, consequences that I think are worth studying. We also have a shared heritage of uh, the Catholic Church, which has been a very powerful institution in, in Latin America. Um, you know that uh, abortion is illegal in every country in Latin America except um, Cuba and Puerto Rico. Uh, so that's an example of the power of the Catholic Church, even though there have been, quote, uh, leftist governments in, uh, in, uh, in power in much of South America over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so I'm a very much a lumper, not a splitter when it comes to Latino populations. I'm all for looking at differences by national origin, but not, uh, not to diminish the uh, importance of the group. This is an example of a, a study on asthma uh, in children to exemplify some of the genetic admixture. Mexican Americans are uh, on average about 50-50, but it goes the full spectrum. Um, in this sample, Puerto Ricans, um, uh, you can see it, uh, have a higher proportion of European admixture, um, a surprisingly high uh, contribution of indigenous mixture and African. And of course that will vary also considerably uh, in populations uh, driven in part by socioeconomic status, but not exclusively um, across the island and across the population. Um, this is taken from the vital signs report that was referred to, which is great. Um, this is looking at some uh, highlights of social demographic characteristics to give you a snapshot of the groups by national origin. Uh, number of persons who have less than a high school education 
less than 10% of U.S. adults in general uh, among whites and even among African Americans, the number is low. Uh, but look at Mexican population, look at uh, Central American, uh, even the Cubans who are, quote, the more um, middle-class immigrants, supposedly 21% have not finished high school. Limited English proficiency is a critical um, uh, variable that we don't do a very good job of collecting that information in our healthcare systems. Um, and uh, you can see among whites, it's a very small number as expected, but it varies from 17% uh, for Puerto Ricans, where presumably uh, they do learn English in Puerto Rico. Uh, to as high as almost half in the Central Americans. And I think this is a critical factor always in Latinos. And then the percent poverty. Uh, it is on average double that of whites or more, um, even again among the more affluent la Latino groups, uh, the Cuban Americans. Um, and, uh, and so I, there are the differences. Cubans are older. Um, the, the Puerto Ricans, as we know, are citizens. Uh, the undocumented burden is predominantly among Mexican and, and uh, Central American, uh, to a lesser extent among Caribbean uh, Latinos, uh, and so forth. So I think this is a beginning to, to look at this. However, I will also um, challenge us that one of the challenges is to understand why these outcomes are better than expected. If one looks at these SES parameters of education and poverty, you would not expect outcomes to be better. You would expect that the paradigm in public health of your poor, your, your health is gonna be worse, would hold. The fact that for Latinos and for what we know about Asians, it appears to be uh, similar, they're worse. They're, they're, they're worse um, um, uh, outcomes, uh, they're worse um, SES, lower SES, and education does not translate to worse outcomes is an important uh, observation that needs to be studied. Um, these are also data that <clears throat> published by the CDC a few years ago. Uh, we've heard a lot about life expectancy in the last uh, couple of, uh, last few months uh, regarding what's happening to poor whites. As remember, it's poor whites, poor and lower middle class whites, not all whites, where the mortality rates are going up. Um, but Latina women have the longest life expectancy in the U.S. In those same data that looked at the changes that have happened among whites, African-American uh, mortality rates have dropped faster than any other group. Unfortunately, they started off much higher, so they're still higher. Uh, but they are moving in the right direction. Uh, that's good news. Uh, for Latinos, their mortality rates look like Germany. Um, and, uh, and, and in the charts of the high-income countries, the U.S., how the U.S. has flattened with regards to white mortality, particularly uh, first coming out with women and then with, uh, and now with both men and women, um, but with Latino mortality rates, are, and that no one is A, talking about that or understanding why that is the case. And I think we, we should talk about it and really try to understand it. A more recent study about that if you're poor and live in San Francisco, Manhattan, or Birmingham, uh, and you're poor, you live three years longer than if you lived in Detroit or in rural areas in the US. And what is that about? Place matters, we've been saying that for some time, uh, but th there are something about an urban environment that tries to take care of its most disadvantaged populations that appears to make a difference. A three-year life expectancy difference is pretty big in a public health perspective, um, uh, as, we, as we know. Um, so um, these are, uh, the healthy immigrant, as we <clears throat> have called it, uh, the paradox is uh, probably accounting for a good amount of this observation, but it's not the entire answer. People have talked about the salmon hypothesis. I recently reviewed a paper for a, a high-profile clinical journal where this was proposed to explain um, uh, an observation about um, 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 kidney disease uh, in Latinos. There is some misclassification, as I alluded to earlier, People will phenotypically look at someone and say, well, you're this. And with Latinos, you can't always be sure. Um, and I could tell you stories about growing up, I mean, having my kids and being thought people were talking one language or another, and not assuming I wasn't Latino because I wasn't brown uh, in California. Uh, and that's a stereotype. Um, uh, so there, there are many different, so it's a self-identify, you ask. Um, and in medical records, it's been shown, there was a study a number of years ago that Latinos were often, most often would be misclassified as whites. 
And so if someone comes in with a heart attack, dies, and someone looks at, oh, they're white, and that you could imagine there would be misclassification accounting for some of this um, uh, information. Let's run through some uh, data on health, important health statistics. This is infant mortality rates. The U.S. gets um, a lot of negative press about how badly we rank in infant mortality compared to other high-income countries. But over the last decade, we've seen uh, improvement in all groups, particularly highlight uh, the 18% drop in African Americans, even though they still have uh, way too high an infant mortality rate. Uh, and among the Latino groups, the Puerto Rican population had the highest rates, and it has now dropped significantly down to um, still a little bit higher than the other groups, but not that much more. Um, notice the Cuban rate of 3%. The Cubans in Cuba have about a 4% infant mortality rate. So, um, and and this, is a, the, this is a very sensitive measure of a, of a global measure of the population health. This is causes of death <clears throat> um, taken from the vital signs report. Latinos, uh, again, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, the three leading causes of death in the US. And you see the huge gap in heart disease and cancer um, uh, globally Latinos, so we'll see, look at one uh, national origin difference. Um, and then so forth down the list, diabetes is higher, we know that. Um, uh, Alzheimer's disease is lower, uh, and that's interesting. And there's other clinical data coming out of Kaiser that uh, one of the, our postdocs at UCSF uh, is working on getting published uh, that shows the same thing. A lower mortality for Alzheimer's, for all minority groups actually, within Kaiser compared to whites. Um, renal diseases uh, balances out. Chronic lung disease is considerably lower, and uh, not all of this is related to tobacco, although it's a good amount of it, um, and then unintentional injuries. These are Mexicans compared to Puerto Ricans. Um, you know, they have data on Dominicans and Cubans and Central Americans, so the Vital Signs Report uh, reports these same data for all the national origin groups. Uh, it's a contrast of, <clears throat> Uh, if you wish, uh, the two largest Latino population groups in the U.S. by national origin. Mexicans are 65 percent, Puerto Ricans are a little over 10 percent. Um, more heart disease among Puerto Ricans, in fact, heart disease among Puerto Ricans is very similar to whites. Um, and cancer is uh, lo still lower than uh, compared to, uh, to whites in both groups. Um, and again, cancer is becoming close to becoming number one cause of death uh, in U.S. Latinos and in the U.S. Uh, general population as well, as it is in, in other, some countries in Latin America. As we continue to drive cardiovascular mortality down, it's one of the more remarkable accomplishments of health, um, health care, uh, and lifestyle change in the last 50 years, um, where you've seen a precipitous, you know, more than a 50% decrease in mortality in cardiovascular disease in the United States um, uh, and, and related primarily to, to behavior change, but also to some, uh, some specific therapies. Uh, and again, you see COPD being higher among Puerto Ricans, so it was still far lower than it was for whites. And Alzheimer's, uh, diabetes, about the same. Um, I think now most people are aware that diabetes is uh, just as common among uh, Puerto Ricans and other Latinos as it is among Mexicans. The idea that this was a Oh, it's an indigenous mix, that's why you see it in Mexicans, is incorrect. And we also see excess more diabetes in all minority groups, as you know. This is prevalence of heart disease taken from American Heart Association. Again, Latino men and women have lower. Worth noting that stroke is more common among women in general, and Latino women have higher stroke rates um, than Latino men. Um, this is data from Seoul, uh, the study on Latinos. I know Larissa ended up not being able to come, but um, she would go on and on about Seoul, which is a terrific study. It's a great research resource. Uh, the National Heart Lung Blood Institute has 16,000 adults that they're following. They're completing wave number two. Um, the highlight of this slide is to show uh, by country of birth in terms of cardiovascular risk factors, U.S. residents for more than 10 years, and language preference. And it's one of the questions I think that always comes up. Oh, is this health advantage going to go away? once the immigrants uh, get acculturated? And that's a question that I will leave you with. Um, Foreign-born Latinos across the board appear to do to have a, a healthier profile. 
A uh, higher proportion have no risk factor, a lower proportion have more than three risk factors, and about and a little less than half report having coronary heart disease or stroke. Uh, if you look by country of birth, if you look by residence in the U.S., um, again, you see similar trends. So there is this uh, healthy immigrant effect uh, appears to be present. And in terms of language preference, which is the third way of trying to get at this construct of acculturation, which is really hard to measure, I would argue, uh, with any kind of self-report. Uh, but these three are pretty good if you use them in combination or, or isolated. Um, uh, you can see a similar trend. Uh, so if you respond in Spanish, keep in mind that Seoul is 80% immigrants. Um, it is four communities. It's not population-based. It misses out on a lot of the Latino population. It's a very in-depth vertical study, uh, and it is very valid uh, in, uh, in and of itself, but it's not necessarily a, uh, it is population sample, but not population of, not representative of the entire Latino population. Cancer among women, um, look at what race does to cancer rates. If, you, if someone says, well, you know, we sh race doesn't matter, we, we shouldn't be even talking about race anymore, show them cancer rates. Um, you know, the, they vary remarkably, even more so for men, uh, and not all fully explained by behavior. And here we can look at, at either disparities or why, uh, let's say, Latino women have less breast cancer uh, in incidence. Um, I'll take you quickly one part of that story. This is a, a study that uh, my colleague Laura Ferman did in California, pursuing a genetic uh, source for part of that explanation of why breast cancer was less common, using case control design, pulling together several studies from Northern and Southern California, and pursuing uh, to find a gene, and then using replication analysis with other studies. They found a gene in an unexpected area, in the estrogen receptor area, uh, ESR1 there. It's, not an, it's, it's a well-known gene that's associated with breast cancer, and, but this gene was present only in women with indigenous American background. And it was not that uncommon. It was 15% of the women had it. Um, and in their analysis showed uh, an odds ratio of protection uh, of about 40% decrease of, uh, of breast cancer. Um, so here is um, a genetic factor that's protective, that has been uh, uh, preserved amongst Latino populations as part of the um, indigenous population in the Americas. Um, uh, not a whole lot has been done with these kinds of research, so I think this is one of the areas of discovery, understanding that uh, NIH, uh, NIMHD should be uh, interested. This is all funded by National Cancer Institute. Among men, you see differences in cancer that are equally um, uh, sur uh, impressive. African-American men have an excess rate of prostate cancer, which is remarkable. Um, and I don't believe that we really know yet. There are some genetic variants that are associated, but it's not the whole story. We see that amongst um, liver cancer, I'll give you as an example, is higher among minorities. But we don't really know why uh, these different groups have excess liver cancer. We, we, we believe and we think we're pretty certain that for ha Asian and Pacific Islanders, it's a hepatitis B driven. Uh, but for African Americans, it's not entirely clear uh, that hepatitis B is the answer. And for Latinos, it actually probably varies by national origin group, uh, where hepatitis B is not, uh, the, is not the cause. C may be part of it. But there may be something, and maybe it's fat uh, or you know, inflammation provoked by, by uh, deposits of uh, fat in the liver. Uh, so again, an area that needs to be um, further research. But let me deviate, um, skip over this. We know a lot of the things that are related to, to cancer. These are smoking data from Seoul. <clears throat> um, again, not reflective of the national picture. They get that better from NHANES or NHIS. Uh, but the Cubans, you can see smoke at higher rates, so do the Puerto Ricans. Uh, in the Puerto Rican, the, the biggest concern for years has been the higher rates of smoking among the women. Uh, and it has trended down slightly over the years, but not as much as it should. The second number is the non-dailies, um, those who, people who do not smoke every day. So clearly they're not addicted. So the paradigm of addiction uh, in smoking is evolving. Uh, look at the Dominican rates. They're very low. 
Um, they actually look more like Mexican or Central American, right? So this idea that uh, the Caribbean Latinos are going to be more alike uh, didn't hold up here, uh, at least not in smoking behavior. And this is the first time that we had U.S.-based data on Dominicans in any significant way, um, and that they're uh, being they're mostly uh, recruited in the Bronx. And again, see the very low rates for women. Now the National rates do not break down by national origin in, in these data, but you can see the Latino rates nationally, 15%, uh, less than 10% of women, uh, similar to Asian. Uh, so smoking is an area where we have uh, traditionally done better, even though I just showed you data where rates are higher. Uh, we also see a great SES gradient in smoking, which is actually more compelling than race ethnicity. Um, less than 1% of medical students smoke, um, nurses have quit smoking, um, uh, and people with PhDs is less than 5%, so you do see this incredible gradient of uh, lower smoking rates among by education. But why are these differences by lung cancer? If I may deviate for a minute, we know that cancer <clears throat> takes at least 10 years to develop after you've been exposed uh, heavily to, to cigarettes, that intensity is related. If you smoke one cigarette a day, your risk of cancer is probably elevated, like it is if you're exposed to secondhand smoke intensely. But it's much higher if you smoke 20 cigarettes a day. It's a very linear um, relationship. Odds ratios go up considerably. There are other environmental exposures that uh, we uh, know are car carcinogens, particularly combustion products. Uh, and then there's genetics that have been pursued. There is an area of chromosome 15, I believe, that's been consistently found to be associated with lung cancer across various populations, um, and whether or not there are some uh, variations here that are worth pursuing. This is unknown territory right now. But the data from the multi-ethnic cohort study published 10 years ago now in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, have not yet been fully clarified as far as I know. Um, this is a, a cohort study, multi-ethnic, California and Hawaii based, so that's the populations that are present. Uh, prospectively identified cases of lung cancer from SEER um, uh, in um, predominantly, or well, majority were in men, and used African Americans as the referent group because they had the highest rate of lung cancer, and stratified by smoking intensity. And then the numbers on the next slide are relative risk of lung cancer by smoking level. And the amazing thing here is that for the same level of smoking, uh, 11 to 20 cigarettes, just to pick that line, um, African Americans and Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians were same, were statistically not different. But Latinos, Japanese Americans, and whites were, had hazard ratios uh, that were significantly lower. Same carcinogen, same intensity, uh, and the self-identified race, ethnicity, uh, led to a very different risk of an outcome that we all care about because only 15% of people live five years after you get lung cancer. It wasn't until you got to 30 that you even the playing field or the, bad, the badness of the playing field in terms of statistical uh, differences between these hazard ratios. Now, why does this happen? I don't know. Um, one of the smoking chemists, I blocking on his name now, says he, he, he now has an answer as to why the African Americans are higher, but he didn't figure out the Latinos one, but I haven't seen the paper, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Lots of explanations, one, genetic factors linked to African ancestry is one possibility, some in gene environment interaction. Metabolism differences is one pathway that we worked on, um, not related to this outcome, but just had done some work on differences in metabolism among blacks and whites. Latinos were not different than, than whites in, that, in our studies, uh, blacks were. Menthols always comes up because um, uh, mentholated brands are smoked predominantly by African Americans and Puerto Ricans and not by almost any other group in the world. It's a starter brand, uh, you know, it has a 10, 15% market share in the US, but it has very little uptake outside of the United States. Smoking topography, which is the reference to how people smoke, so you hold it in longer, or that kind of stuff which I don't think has been shown to prove much. And then whether well, there are protective factors. Um, uh, you all know that nicotine is uh, designed <clears throat> in cigarettes to be absorbed in the alveoli capillary inner space. Uh, so it is, a, it is something that is taken in by this incredibly effective system uh, of drug delivery, which is our lungs. Um, and that's how the nicotine in, uh, in uh, electronic cigarettes will come in as well. Another uh, example of differential outcomes by ethnicity um, that are unexplained. This is data from a Kaiser diabetes cohort. Um, 
all patients taken care of at Kaiser. This is a follow-up at 10 years, and the paper was actually published looking at the Asian national origin groups uh, in California. Um, notice that for African-American, Latino, and all Asians combined, the risk of a heart attack with diabetes at 10 years within Kaiser, so similar healthcare, is actually lower than for whites. So fewer heart attacks. Uh, isn't that interesting? Um, and the Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos did as well. The Pacific Islanders were actually higher, and then South Asians were not different. But we looked at kidney disease, it was the opposite. All the minority groups had more end-stage renal disease, so ending up on dialysis. Um, and this was true for the Latinos. Uh, granted, predominantly Latinos in Northern California, Kaiser, are Mexican or Central American. We don't have that kind of granularity of data among Cubans and, and, uh, and Puerto Ricans. And notice that for Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, and Pacific Islanders, again, they behave more, uh, increase at ESRD. South Asians, um, uh, whose background uh, ancestrally actually is more white uh, and African, uh, some African admixture with a north-south gradient, uh, are, uh, are in, statistically not different from whites in terms of the risk of ESRD. Um, study on generation and diabetes uh, shown some mixed results. So the idea of, well, when you come to the U.S. and you become acculturated, you get worse. You get more disease. You, get, you pick up bad habits. You start eating at, uh, what was it, that wacko taco, whatever. Uh, uh, and, you get, and, you, and you lose your natural advantage of having eaten more natural food. So this is a salsa, the Sacramento area Latino study on aging, um, all Mexican, 60 to 101 years old at, at, uh, at uh, recruitment, and they measured generation, acculturation scale, and language. The diabetes prevalence increased by generation in this study from 29% to 35% to 40%, with an odds ratio uh, for the third generation that was double. So this would support the, the, uh, the hypothesis, the proposal that you will get worse, that my kids will get worse health than I am, I don't know, than I have, I, I don't know, that, that I would assume presumably. Um, we also then did an analysis of the HAPZ study, which is a, again, an elderly cohort followed uh, by uh, Dr. Marquides uh, in Texas. It's all the Southwest. Um, it's been followed since 1990. Again, all Mexican-Americans, uh, and again, uh, 65 at baseline. Uh, you can see the, the parameters of the, the, of the sample there, about half were immigrants. Uh, we defined uh, being uh, uh, less privileged socioeconomic status, having less than high school, uh, and having uh, public insurance or no insurance. Um, and 27% had diabetes at baseline, so we excluded them. All, all of this is by self-report. Um, we looked then at incident diabetes in this cohort over the course of 1990 to uh, 2010, I think, was the, well, 2005, sorry, there's my slide, um, and found an interesting relationship that um, uh, those who continued to answer the survey in Spanish and were of low socioeconomic status by our definition, uh, going from first to third generation, had an increase in diabetes, in incident diabetes, new diabetes, um, that was a ha adjusted hazard ratio of 1.8. But those who responded to the survey in English and had a higher SES, mind you, higher SES means you've graduated from high school and had uh, uh, some insurance that wasn't Medicaid. Um, going from first to third generation actually had a lower risk of diabetes. So these kind of data would imply that we really need to look at this multidimensionally with different social factors involved. Uh, the social class does play a major role in this acculturation spectrum that we talk about. Uh, and there may be an advantage, actually, to become acculturated for some groups, uh, while there's a disadvantage in some groups who remain unacculturated, especially if they're poor. Uh, and so I think that Seoul may be a, a, a data set where this can be looked at. Asthma mortality is excessive among Latinos. Uh, Puerto Ricans have one of the highest known mortality and diagnosis rates of asthma in the world. Uh, this is not understand why. Um, Mexicans, Latinos also have one of the lowest. So again, here heterogeneity is important to, to understand. Obesity, we've talked about 40% um, of Latinos, uh, slightly lower than for blacks. Interestingly, <clears throat> the rate there for Puerto Rico of 28% is those on the island. 
So the, on the island, there's less obesity than there is uh, in the U.S. Um, finish up with a couple of these. Uh, screening for colon cancer. Um, Latinos are behind. Limited English proficiency is a major issue. And ascertainment of English, um, uh, f uh, f uh, the um, uh, proficiency in English is an important metric that we need to look. I won't go over all the details of what uh, uh, the importance of LEP. Um, the data on health outcomes is mixed. Um, there's generally poor communication, um, but the effect on clinical outcomes varies. There's clearly a shortage of clinicians who speak other languages, and language discordance is very common. Interpreters are often not available and infrequently used, and uh, often used who are not professional, and this is really a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, we have endorsed the, the census question because of the simplicity and the fact that everybody uses it, uh, everybody responds to it. So measure asked by the census, and then if you, if you say le less than very well, you are LEP. But there is a group that says well that probably is mixed, and by asking them what, what language you prefer your medical care in, uh, we seem to get at uh, the group that really needs uh, interpretation. Um, we also found in analysis, one of the people I worked with, that patients with low literacy, if they are in a discordant relationship in terms of language, uh, the low literacy gets trumped by the fact that they are, they are in a discordant relationship in terms of communication metrics. Uh, so even in that group that we worry about uh, in speaking, having language concordance is important. There's empiric data that says that people who see doctors, clinicians who speak the same language, have better glucose control, feel better, have less pain, better understanding of instructions, better medication adherence, uh, ask more questions so it's more patient-centered care. One may say, well, that's a no-brainer, but you need empirical evidence to be able to persuade policymakers that somebody should really pay attention to this, and the, care, the quality of care of these patients needs to include professional interpretation. Um, uh, this will get people's attention. So we say, well, if you don't speak English, you're high risk of readmission. That's a Medicare performance uh, metric. Uh, money's on the table. People pay attention to this. So get interpreters into the, into the system. Um, I'll just close with this. Um, I alluded to these questions. So um, will the health profile worsen with second, third, fourth generation? I think when I talk to people, Everyone assumes this is gonna happen. And I challenge the community to say, show me. Uh, generate data, and let's look at it, uh, let's look at data and see what's happening to second, third generation. I don't uh, necessarily uh, have a strong reason to say it's not gonna happen, but I like to, to think that, uh, that this isn't necessarily gonna always be the case. How does acculturation affect health behaviors? We have a lot of data on, on smoking and alcohol. Um, how does it affect outcomes? How do we look at acculturation? How do we measure it? How do we balance it with social class? Um, we do need to have a very standardized method of ascertainment. Whatever it is, we need to all use the same method. Uh, it may not be your favorite. The worst thing is to have you know, one investigator in Texas say, I like the question this way, and another investigator in California, oh no, I like it that way, and another one in New York says, oh, I like it this way. Uh, then uh, how can you compare? So we just have to get on board with common use. And then do we focus on differences by country of origin, ancestry, region? I mean, these are all factors that uh, uh, you're all uh, familiar with. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Hello, hello, yes. Thank you, Eliseo, this was awesome. The data is, and again, we, we know that. <clears throat> Latinos know the differences. I think it's fascinating what you show. I just had my um, genome done by a friend of mine, University of Chicago, just for the heck of it. And of course, in the Dominican Republic, 
my personal ID says that I'm white. Well, I know that I'm not white because my brother looks just like a brother, you know, one of my brothers. Uh, however, my mix is 41% West African area, which is where my great grandfather came from, the Canary Islands, something like that, and the Moors invaded Spain, so that's where I come from. 23% Asian. I was surprised about that because, you know, I never saw that in me. But again, the Tainos y Caribes, right, in Puerto Rico, and I don't, yes. in, in Cuba was the Jibaros, right? No? Había Tainos. Yeah, yeah, right. So we basically share the same Indian or uh, native heritage in some ways, but the genetic composition is different. And then there was like, uh, I think it was 28% or something else, who, who knows what. But the, the fact of the matter is that your whole talk ended up uh, saying the same thing that we all know, that is we have lack of education being a contributor to how these things are interpreted. The, <clears throat> the ancestry issue is uh, a, a, an important scientific tool. Um, I think I'm, um, I'll, I'll, I believe that race, ethnicity is a social construct, that self-identity is the gold standard. Um, but this is a tool that we can use to learn about mechanisms and, and, uh, and how different uh, things are, might be explained. Um, uh, Latinos are interesting in that regard because of that. And it's right there, we're right here in the, the US. Uh, African Americans are also have a significant amount of racial admixture with whites and American Indians. Um, so it, it, we're not unique in that, in that context, although the extent of it mixture is not as much. Um, uh, and at NIH, you know, the genetics people are like saying, you know, there was a, a, a commentary in science um, earlier this year that said, we should take race out of genetic studies. And um, it was well thought, well written, but I think they missed the big picture. Uh, on, on what, on, and so there is some, uh, some of this tension uh, about this, yeah. Yes. Buenos dias y gracias por esa presentación. My name is Nancy Lopez and I'm a sociologist. I also direct the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice at the University of New Mexico. And we recently did a study where we included a question of racialization among Latinos, mm -hmm. 1,500 Latinos nationally at the Robert Wood Johnson Center for Health Policy that included a question on what is your street race? If you were walking down the street, what race do you think other Americans who do not know you would automatically assume you were based on what you look like? And what we found is that those of us that are Afro-Latinos or seen as Arab or Mexican, right. basically some variation of brown, even after controlling for education, had higher odds of obesity, had higher, uh, higher odds of very poor health. So my question is about what's um, going to be decided by the census. Right now, there is a lot of value to having the two-part question because not only can we disaggregate by national origin, but also race as a master social status. I'm wondering if there's any consensus among researchers about the need to retain that question because if I look around the room, anyone here could be Latino, could be Hispanic, but we all occupy different racial statuses, may have different interactions when we look for a house discipline in schools, with the police, immigration, the airport. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping that there's some consensus because I think that health disparities researchers are really on the cutting edge of describing the importance of not conflating national origin right. with race as a master social status that's based on what you look like. So th thank you for your comment. I look forward to seeing your uh, results uh, published and send them, to, send them to us. So two, two points. Sorry, I don't work for the census, so I can't. Uh, OMB is their own, they're, they're in their own world. Um, but they will dictate, uh, if they change these categories, we need to adhere to that as NIMHD. So that's why I pay close attention. I, I, I saw a presentation where they were proposing doing this. The basis is that that question as currently presented is confusing in the response to race. The, the loss, there, the, some people say, well, the Afro-Latinos may not check, may not have an opportunity to say they're black, and that's, a, that's an issue. That is a loss of that. Uh, but they will most likely, almost certainly, identify as Latino to begin with if they're given the option as opposed to being black. 
Um, but you also brought up a second part, uh, the part about perceived uh, race, um, which I think is a critical construct that we don't typically ask in, uh, in our studies. Uh, and it's not asked in the census. And so I think the, the idea of asking that uh, in the census, or at least a part of the, you know, even in the uh, American Community Survey uh, as an experiment would be worth suggesting. Nancy Adler had developed uh, this latter question about social status, which not only asked about where, where do you stand and how do people see you on a social ladder. So I think it's a perceived race of what, what you're getting at, which I think uh, is a is a is a is another construct which I think is va worth uh, exploring. So, hello. Hi. Good morning, Dr. Perez Establo. So my name is Elizabeth Ophelia. Oh, hi, I'm from, Elizabeth. I didn't see you. <laughs> from Morehouse School of Medicine, and uh, so I also have a research uh, program that I work with called the Research Centers of Minority Institutions. It's just saying that for the group to understand where my question is coming from. I know you're aware of the program. And I just want to also add my thanks to you. I think this was a very interesting um, discussion and really, I think, expand some of the thought process around understanding resiliency on the one hand and disparities on the other hand. And that, so that's the framework of my question. As you know, uh, these institutions have uh, multidisciplinary groups from basic science to population health. And when I look at the NIMHD budget versus the NIH budget that's looking at disparity populations, but not necessarily, I think, in the comprehensive way you're defining, I think the question for me remains in the short amount of time and the urgency that I see here, what is the role of these existing programs that are structured in a way that would allow us, I think, to work across disciplines in collaboration with obviously other scientists, and how do you see that as you look at the broader landscape um, in moving forward with disparities, or, or I should say, the science of disparities? I'm not sure I know what you're asking. Um, <clears throat> the Elizabeth uh, uh, the, referred to the RCMI program, um, and um, NIMHD. Um, inherited the research centers for minority institutions a number of years ago. This is probably my uh, ride to the airport. <laughs> yes, this will have to be the last question, please. <laughs> uh, I'm just finishing up, thanks. Uh, can I call you right back? Thanks, yeah. Um, <laughs> Should I ask my question? Is that on me? <laughs> yeah, I think you're the last question. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we're very much in favor of continuing uh, to support, as you know, these institutions um, uh, through a competitive process uh, that will actually generate not only um, uh, behavioral uh, and biological data, but also clinical and population data uh, to help us understand focused in these uh, institutions as opposed to uh, all the studies being done at Harvard and uh, Stanford and UCSF and, uh, and Hopkins, yes, <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks for your presentation, Dr. perez Dabo. I, um, well, I think we, most of us are um, familiar with the Hispanic, uh, Hispanic paradox, at least those of us in um, public health. And of course, the data you've shown this morning um, further, further, I'm sorry, supports that. In fact, it's quite remarkable that all of this population-based data sort of converges um, to really uh, show the Hispanic um, advantage in terms of health. Given uh, the, the data, I'm curious about your um, thoughts on focusing on minority status in general, meaning focusing our resources and research on minority status as opposed to those groups who share the disproportionate amount of disease in these particular areas. Um, I think if I understand your question, so um, we are the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparity. So I think I take that literally until they tell us otherwise. Uh, and for me, minority health will imply looking at the race ethnic groups within the groups. Uh, that allows us then to advance our knowledge about why we see the differences that we, that we see. Uh, why some group has an advantage 
uh, has better results, I think is a worthwhile scientific question. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned resiliency as a mechanism, um, whether it relates to social networks, for example, as another, I think mean, knowing that, and if this is a population where we observe these, that will actually contribute to our knowledge uh, that will apply to everyone, uh, not just that particular group. Um, I don't want to leave you with the message that everything is great for Latinos, you know, <laughs> that we have excess amount of accidents in children, uh, there is a tremendous pressure on family function, uh, alcohol binge drinking is a problem, among, um, particularly among men. Um, uh, there's excess liver disease, I didn't bring that up, the chronic liver disease is more common. Um, uh, HIV AIDS is uh, predominantly now an epidemic of, uh, of uh, minorities, uh, of, of African Americans and Latinos, um, among men who have sex with men as well as other groups uh, with, uh, related to um, uh, other behaviors. Uh, and so I don't think that uh, there are men, a number of conditions where Latinos actually do worse. And in health care, um, the uh, quality uh, disparities report that HRQ produces every year, uh, Latinos do uh, worse on all, well, majority of the metrics uh, are not either, they're either worse than whites uh, or the same. Very few are they better. So the processes of care and the health care process uh, Latinos are, are also at a disadvantage. So uh, we are, uh, you know, we're all part of the same uh, enterprise in this regards. I think the differences in priorities and, you know, is reflected often in the funding. Uh, and when you see, you know, where you see more disparities or less disparities. Uh, but we are interested in uh, minority health in and of itself, uh, not just um, uh, this health disadvantages exclusively. So. Please join me in thanking stop. Dr. Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I hated to be the one sort of being the police on the time and cutting people off in their questions, but we have a, a little bit of a remedy. So for the rest of the program, if you will pick up a little card, and there are people who are designated in the, in the organization, if you'll just raise your hand. Uh, for people who are going to be picking up the cards. And what we're asking you to do is if you will write down your questions, give them to the folks who are collecting them, and that way we'll make sure we get them, at least if they're not answered within the context of the program today, we will be able to follow up with you and make sure you get answers to your questions. We even have a remedy for folks online. So um, if you will, if you're online, if you will email your questions to X as in X-ray, G as in go, V as in victory, at cdc.gov. Those questions will be collected and they will also be answered. And again, if not in the context of the program today, we will be able to follow up with you afterwards. 